James chapter 3. I want you to think as we begin this morning uh, about this example. Uh, J.I. Packer, who is a theologian, uh, gives an example of what it is to be like in a, uh, in a British train station. Uh, and this is, I don't know which one, uh, I googled British train station and I assume Google did not let me down. And so here's a picture of that train station. And he explains, if you're standing there on the platform, uh, or if you're sitting on a bench nearby watching, there's just a ton of activity. Uh, obviously just the people, and if you like to people watch, it's kind of like an airport in that way. But the trains, they come in and out, and there's one that comes from one direction and one that comes from another direction. And sometimes, if you were able to get just outside of the station a little bit, you would find trains that are on sidings, and they're waiting for something. Uh, I drove, uh, drove, I rode on an Amtrak from Little Rock to L.A. one time. And there were a couple times where, uh, several times, as we're going across the country, where we would pull off on a siding, that's one of those uh, tracks that goes off to the side, and we would wait, uh, and we would sit there for a little bit, and I would think, what are we doing? Why, why aren't we going? This trip is already 55 hours to get from Little Rock to L.A. Uh, I don't need to wait on a siding. I need to go. And, and sure enough, after we waited a little while, I'd see a freight train go by. Uh, and I learned somewhere along the way that freight trains took precedence because what they're doing makes more money than the passengers on the other trains. And so they would go by as you waited, and then you'd get off of the siding and get back going again. And he would say, if you're just a passenger watching all of these things, you understand there's probably some rhyme or reason to it, but you don't know exactly how it works. Uh, and then he explained, if you could get into the control room, you would see something like this. Now, when J.I. Packer wrote this, it was 1973, and so I'm sure their control room didn't look exactly like this. But you, what you would see is almost like air traffic control, but on tracks. You would see people who are looking at screens, and they understand all of these trains are doing a certain thing. And this train is this length, and it travels at this rate of speed, and in this direction, and this is where it's going, and this is the cargo. And as they see all of these different things on a screen, they understand what to signal when to signal a train to stop or to move to a siding or to go or what to do. And as we think about wisdom <clears throat> and about the ways of God, we may make the mistake that a lot of us would make at this point, which is to say, this is, this is what the wisdom of God is like, isn't it? Do you have this overview of everything where you can see things in a different way? And we've probably thought of it that way sometimes. And so as God gives us wisdom, what we think is that we will have kind of this overview of things. And so all these events of life that don't make sense on their own, if we could just see them from the control room, everything makes sense. And so we say things like, everything happens for a reason. Uh, and we try to, when people suffer loss in their life, we talked about grief on Sunday evenings last month. Uh, as they suffer loss, we try to help them make reason of it. And so we say well-meaning things like, God just needed another angel. Now let's not get into the theology of that and how that's not exactly how angels work to begin with, but... Most people who, when they're, when they're grieving, that's really not incredibly helpful. And, and maybe it is to you, and if you're one that it is, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on you. Or if you've said that, I'm not trying to pick on you either, although you might think about it next time beforehand. We tend sometimes to think that because we see all of these things from a different angle, that there's now meaning in everything, and we can interpret it all. And the problem comes with sometimes things happen that we just can't find meaning in. And so Packer says this, the mistake that's commonly made is to suppose this is an illustration of what God does when he bestows wisdom. To suppose, in other words, that the gift of wisdom consists in a deepened insight into the meaning and purpose of events going on around us and ability to see what God has done and what he has done in a particular case and what he's going to do next, which is to say we are people that can make meaning of everything. And again, the drawback in that is at some point you're going to run into a thing in life that you just can't figure the meaning out in. Or maybe you'll run into something life in, in life and you think you've figured out the meaning and then it turns in a different direction and once again, you don't know the meaning anymore. Packer says instead, it's a little more like this. It's learning how to drive. Because in learning how to drive, it's not that you have an incredible overview of everything. When you're driving down the road, you don't see it from above. You don't see things at a different angle. Uh, we had a car in the shop a couple weeks ago and the rental car that they gave me had a camera at every angle of the car, and somehow it could figure out where you were at from above. It's like the camera integrated with the Google Earth all at the same time. And so I could see in my driveway as I was pulling in where the car was in the driveway as if I was watching my car pull in the driveway from above. And it was the coolest thing ever. 
uh, my driveway has a point where it kind of drops off at the end, and I'm not always good at it. And so usually I'll have to open my door and kind of peek out and see where I'm at. And I was watching it from above, and I thought, this is great. But I couldn't do that when I was going down the road. Because what I would begin to do is start to look at that screen and miss everything around me. And what Packer says is, is you have learned to drive. All of those things of learning to drive just become integrated into who you are as a driver. And you react to things because you know. And those who have just started out driving understand that you haven't gotten all of that yet. And those who have been driving for a few years look back even just a few years and think, man, I, I understand this. There's a lot more feel to it that I didn't know before. And those who have been driving for a very long time, it's almost second nature, isn't it? You just kind of know what to do and how to react before things come along. He says, you simply try and see and do the right thing in the actual situation that present, pre presents itself. The effect of divine wisdom is to enable you and me to do just that in the actual situations of life. What God is doing is not trying to throw us into the control room, but trying to make us aware in situations as they happen as to what we should be doing as Christians. So wisdom is not so much e even the things we know or the angle at which, which we see things. It is being able to do as things come along in life. It's these things becoming second nature to us. So James asked the question a different way. Not so much what is wisdom, but who is wise? And he asked that, I think, for a reason we'll get to here in a second. In James 3 and verse 13, he says, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. So he asks, who is wise? But he also asks, who is understanding? And the reason for this is he wants to see who, who are the examples that we can follow. Look for people as you're trying to gain wisdom that are the people you can follow who are already being wise. Because those who are wise, uh, it's not because they just look contemplative all the time. Uh, it's not because they speak with a little more serious voice and, and they, they demand respect in that way. Uh, it's not because they have the beard that is the right length. Uh, it, it is not because there are, uh, I had an elder at a former church that I worked at when I went back to visit. When he saw me walked in the door, he, he said, Brian, I see you've got some wisdom now. And it was the gray hair that he was looking at. And I, I laughed to myself and I thought, that's what a lot of people may equate with wisdom. And it, it's the idea that we have had more life experience. But James says here, look to people who you need to follow. Look to people you can learn wisdom from. And first of all, he says an understanding. And understand the way that understanding is used here in this context is in the idea of expertise. And we get this in worldly things. When there's a thing we want to know more about, we ask someone who knows about that thing. Uh, I asked David Durham last week in the office. Uh, I built a ramp for my shed so I could drive my lawnmower up into the shed and back out of the shed. And I said to David, you, you do wood stuff. I've seen you build things. Should I treat that with something? It's pressure-treated lumber, but should I put some kind of water seal or something on that? Because I don't want to build a ramp again anytime soon. And David kind of explained to me the process and when to do it and all of that. And if you want to do it, it will do this. And if you want to be lazy and not do it, uh, it will do that. And you get to decide. And so I go to David to ask that question. I do not go, no offense to my own David, to my David to ask that question. Because David doesn't know anything about wood outside and what you need to do. And so I find someone who has expertise in that. And so James would say to us, look to someone who is wise and who has proven that wisdom in things of God. Because you can follow the example of that person. He also says to us that wisdom is shown in good conduct. So people that are conducting themselves well, and this kind of answers one of the questions that Butch asked in class this morning. Those who are conducting themselves well are showing the wisdom which they have. So if you look to someone as your example of wisdom who is constantly spinning out of control, I don't know that that's probably the best example of wisdom. And if we are people who are constantly spinning out of control and we've convinced ourselves that we're wise, we might need to, like James explained back in chapter 1, take another look in the mirror and figure out where it is that we're going wrong with that. And also, wisdom is shown in all things in gentleness. You wouldn't put these two together normally, would you? You think of wisdom and you think of knowledge and facts and uh, maybe life experience that has brought you some sort of wisdom. But wisdom is also shown in gentleness, which if we were to think of the converse side of this, if wisdom is shown in gentleness, then what does it mean when we encounter people who are constantly brash towards others? What does it mean when we encounter people who are constantly trying to pick a fight with somebody else? What does it mean when we ourselves are being argumentative all the time? That maybe this wisdom that James is talking about is not showing itself 
in us or in the people who are around us. So are they following the wrong examples? And maybe the, the better question for us this morning is, are we? Are we looking to the wrong people as examples of wisdom and following them down a road that is not the road that we want to go down? So then he says in verse 14, but if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, you do not, uh, I'm sorry, do not boast and be false to the truth, which is to say that motives matter. And if you're motivated by these things, by, by envy and ambition and those things, then do not try to say that I'm doing these things on behalf of God. And, and James has mentioned this idea several times already in different contexts, hasn't he? That you have people that are saying they are of God, but the actions that they are doing are not of God. And so if you're doing these things, don't try to tout yourself as doing them of God so that others will follow behind because you're leading people in the wrong direction. And what did he say last week? Be careful about being teachers because the teachers are going to have swifter judgment that comes along. And here as we reach the end of the chapter, be careful about being an example of, in the wrong way of the wrong things because that is not the example that you want to be. These things are not from God. So James says to us, there are two kinds of wisdom. And we would look at it, I think, and think of worldly wisdom and godly wisdom as maybe the easy way we put it. But James talks about it as wisdom from below and wisdom from above. And first of all, wisdom from below. Here in verses 15 and 16, James says, This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but it is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. Isn't it interesting here? Jealousy and selfish ambition sound bad, but we tend to excuse them, don't we? Uh, this is uh, the American spirit and individualism and freedom and rights and we try to paint this in a good light sometimes, and not to say those things by their nature are bad, but sometimes if we're not careful, they lend themselves to these traits, don't they? And we excuse jealousy and selfish ambition by, well, this is just kind of what we do. What if we instead equated it with demonic? We would think of it very much differently, wouldn't we? So think of the descriptors here. This, earth, this uh, wisdom from below is earthly, it is unspiritual, it is demonic, and it brings with it disorder, and it is vile. What have we learned about God all throughout Scripture? God brings order out of chaos. This brings the opposite, disorder in things that are vile. And most of all, these are all things that God is not. So when we chase after this kind of wisdom, we are moving in the opposite direction away from God. And then he said there's another kind of wisdom. There's wisdom from above. In verse 17, James says, But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Th think of these descriptors. It is pure. When we think of, in terms of purity, we tend to think of sexuality all the time, but there's something greater than that here. Wisdom is also pure. It is peaceable. When we are wise, we are seeking peace first before we seek other ways of doing things. It's gentle. It is open to reason. I have a minister friend in Louisiana that made a Facebook post yesterday that just really clicked in my head. And he said, it was the, the day that I found freedom was the day I realized I wasn't right about everything. And I thought, man, there's a lot of wisdom right there, isn't there? It's one thing to be right when it becomes the things of God. And we want to be right with God. But most of us, I hope, could admit we're not right about everything. There are things that happen in life that, that prove that this to us over and over again. So open to reason, full of mercy, and think in terms of God. What, what is full? Something that is beginning to overflow. So our natural inclination, the thing that flows out of us, is mercy toward others. Good fruits. The things that we do are going to be things that are good. And we talked last time, toward the end of our time together, about how good trees bear good fruit, bad trees bear bad fruit, one can't bear the other. So if we are good trees, we're bearing good fruit. We are impartial, and James talked about not showing favoritism early in the chapter, and that we are sincere. All of this is real. So I don't want to say things so that you can know how much I know and know how much you do not know. Uh, every now and then in a sermon, I will tell you about a Greek word, and my wife will get on to me later about it because of the way I have done it. And I don't realize I'm doing it even, and it's not intended to mean anything, but she will say, you know, when you mentioned that Greek word today, you said, you probably don't know this. And I think to myself, well, they probably don't know this. It's Greek. Have you heard of it's Greek to me? There's a reason they say that. 
you probably don't know. But my intent is not to make you feel there and me feel here. It's just, just kind of talking. And I need to realize, man, maybe that does say something I'm not trying to say. Sometimes when we're not careful with the things that we know, we end up making it seem like we are better than others. We live in a world, by the way, who believes, for the most part, that Christians think they are better than everybody else. Now, I don't know a lot of Christians that feel that way or operate based on that, but our world believes it for some reason. So James says to us, be sincere about these things. Be real about what you do. This wisdom from above, by the way, sounds a little bit like love, doesn't it? I, I don't know about you. When I read those verses we just read, I'm taken immediately in my mind to 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient and kind. Love does, uh, does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way open-minded. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believe all, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. So maybe, maybe wisdom and love interrelate a little more than we may think. In verse 18, James says, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Do we usually connect peace and wisdom? We've already mentioned gentleness and wisdom. I don't normally connect peace and wisdom either. Uh, honestly, sometimes when I think of, of wisdom, I, I think in uh, war analogies. I, I almost go the other direction. I, I read a thing about Pearl Harbor this week, and I, I haven't figured out if it's true yet, but if it is true, it, it's pretty amazing that when Pearl Harbor happened, they could have bombed all of the fuel supplies of the fleet that were just a short distance away, but they didn't because they were going after the battleships that were all lined up in a row. Uh, they could have bombed uh, other things there that would have changed the outcome of the war, possibly, but they didn't. Uh, I think in those kinds of terms sometimes, of all these different war things, you see a great example of something a group did in war and the wise decision that was made, but what, what about peace? If you look back through this section of the chapter, James has mentioned either peace or the opposite of peace at least five times. Is peace important to wisdom? Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. We need to be people who are always seeking a peaceful outcome to what is happening. So these two wisdoms, they bring two different results. And, and notice the way they're described here for us. Wisdom from below, it results in disorder and in every vile practice, back in verse 16. And then in verse 18, wisdom from above results in a harvest of righteousness. So the question is, what result are we looking for? Because wherever it is we're aiming, that is where we're going to get. If we will, for a moment, instead of thinking of the wisdom itself, think of where it ends up, I think what we want to choose is pretty obvious, isn't it? So when we are driven by selfishness and jealousy and ambition, we are going to end up in a place we don't want to go. And we are instead driven by open-mindedness and peace and love and mercy then we will end up in the place that God wants us in that harvest of righteousness. So this morning, I, I want you to think about your wisdom. Where does your wisdom lead you? What is your wisdom driven by? And maybe, as, as James asked that question at the beginning, who is wise? Who are the wise ones that you follow, and is their life going in a direction that is in the direction that you want to go? And if it's not, I'd encourage you maybe to change that direction. Change where you're following, who you're following. Or if you are someone who is living life in a way and you feel like it's just not wise and I can see that now, change that and make it different. Uh, that word good conduct that we saw early on, uh, this is one of those Greek things by the way, that you may know already but I'll remind you of. There are a couple different ways that the, they could have interpreted the, the word good and if you were to go backwards into Greek, there is one that talks about an intris intrinsic good, something that is just good through and through, always has been, always will be. And there's another one that talks about something that is good, and that's just a descriptor. It's that one that's being used here, which tells me that good conduct is something that we can change. It's not something you're just born with. You're either just good or bad. We've all heard, well, he's just like that or she's just like that. This is not one of those. You can change the wisdom that you have and change that conduct to be more good and more aligned with who God, God wants you to breathe, be to bring you that harvest of righteousness. So this morning, if you want to follow him the first time, you want to come back to him, you can do that. 
Now, if you have not read your bulletin, you can do that a little differently today than we have in the past. We have always had a time where you can come up here, you can sit on one of the front rows, one of our elders, elders will sit down with you, and you will tell them about what you need. Whether it's to come up and be baptized, or the prayers of the church, or you needed to confess some kind of sin. And I believe that's still appropriate and a good thing. But what I have found over the course of years is, <clears throat> there are a lot more days that I just stand here and sing a song, hoping I remember the words, than days that I see someone actually come up here and sit down and tell us about something. And I'm not sure why that is. Uh, one, I think we probably have gotten used to that, and so that's just what we do. Uh, two, I have found I, it's hard to step out in the, in the aisle. It's hard to walk down here in front of everybody. It's hard to sit down and to verbalize what it is you've been thinking and how you need to change. And now that we're live streaming this online for the entire world, uh, it's hard to know that's out there. And so we are, for those who may not want to come up and do that in this way, going to provide a different way here in the future, uh, beginning today, to do that. Uh, in the Southwest Classroom, which if you don't know directions like I don't, uh, is down the left hall as you're exiting. Go as far as you can and turn left right before you get to the door, and you'll find a classroom back there with one of our elders and his wife that can also talk to you. Uh, you can uh, confess something, give a prayer request, something you need help with, and they will be glad to help you with that too. Uh, some folks want to come up here. Some may want to go back there. The most important thing is that you change your life in the way that it needs to be changed. Or, by the way, and this is the longest invitation ever, but I think it's, it's worth knowing, it doesn't have to happen today. Now, not to say that it shouldn't if today is the time and you have been pricked at your heart, but if something comes to your mind Monday or Tuesday, we all have phones. We all have places where you can come and see us and talk to us. We are happy to talk to you at any time about whatever's going on. Don't wait for the next time there's an invitation. Just know that you can change your life and begin to walk with Christ whenever it is. But if that's right now, please come while we stand and sing.